Good afternoon, everyone. We're so pleased that you're joining us this afternoon for this Sundays at Home program. Throughout the month of February, the National Women's History Museum has paid tribute to women athletes, women's sports, and the history of women's participation in the Olympic Games. In that spirit, today's program is a virtual guest curator-led tour of the museum's popular online exhibit, Game Changers, Women in Sports. My name is Laurie Ann Turgeson, and I'm the Director of Education at the National Women's History Museum. For those who are with us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have attended a Sundays at Home program before, welcome back and thank you for your continued support. We thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to be with us this afternoon. I'm joined today by NWHM Pre-Doctoral Fellow in Women's History, Mariana Brandman. Mari, as we call her, is serving as our guest curator and guide for today's virtual tour. She is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Chicago. Her research interests include 20th century US history, women's and gender history, and race, sexuality, and popular culture. Her dissertation, which I can't wait for her to complete, because it's such a fascinating topic, is called Take Back the Mic, The Rise of Feminist Comic Performance in American Culture. And it traces the work of feminist stand-up comics from the beginnings of the women's liberation movement into the 21st century. Mari received her BA in history from Yale University and her MA from the University of Chicago. A dedicated public historian, she has worked as a researcher and archivist at the Chicago History Museum, the Newberry Library, the University of Chicago's Special Collections Research Center, the National Portrait Gallery, and the Library of Congress. Mari is currently in her second year of a two-year tenure with the museum, and we are so proud of the programming and scholarship that she contributes to the museum. Before I turn the program over to Mari, allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. As always, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website in the days following the event. Mari will answer your questions after her presentation, so please use the chat feature for any comments that you have during the tour and use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions that you may have for Mari about the exhibit. You may ask your questions at any time during the presentation, but they won't be answered until the end of the presentation. We can all agree that sports are integral to American national identity, whether as metaphor, cultural pastime, or economic driver. Though Americans take sports seriously, women and men have had very different experiences with sports participation. Competition, the core element of the national passion for sports, has been problematic for America to accept when applied towards women. Please join me in welcoming Mariana Braman to the screen. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Lorianne, for that introduction. Um, and welcome, everybody, to uh, this virtual tour of Game Changers Women in Sports. The exhibit that we're gonna go through today was curated by Elizabeth L. Moore, a former director of programs at the National Women's History Museum. So today I'm gonna to go through this exhibit. Um, let me get it set up right now. Oh, Lorianne, I cannot seem to share my screen at the moment. Sorry about that, Mari, I thought you could. Let me, um, let me do. Go ahead and try again. Great, thank you. Okay, so here we have the exhibit. Um, so today I'm gonna to go through the exhibit, adding further context and detail um, about the history of American women in sports since the mid 19th century. We'll show a few images and videos that aren't included in the exhibit. Um, but of course, there's plenty even just here in the exhibit that I won't be able to get to because of time. Um, so we'll be including a list of resources uh, in the chat throughout and at the end. And I'll tell you about some of the museum's other resources related to women in sports. Um, so really, I just wanna encourage everyone to continue uh, researching the fascinating and impressive history of women's achievements um, in athletics. Uh, let this be just one of many stops on your way. Um, so here we have the opening quote of the exhibit. This is um, what Lorianne was just referencing. Um, so this exhibit explores the cultural, economic, social, and political barriers women have overcome to play sports and the challenges remaining today. Um, and as we go forward, I want to draw on a quote from um, Dr. Jamie Schultz. Uh, she's a scholar who's written Women's Sports, What Everyone Needs to Know. And she writes, quote, the same rationales that held women back from education and political life were used against them in sport. 
So this really speaks to what the opening quote does too, that so much of what we'll see in the story about women in sports, it just really reflects the broader cultural beliefs and social trends over time. So, okay, starting in the mid 19th century. Um, so outdoor recreation and organized sports rose in popularity greatly following the Civil War. At the time, the movement from a more rural farm-based economy to an urban industrial economy actually created new opportunities for leisure, even among the working class. Um, of course, you know, not massive opportunities, but they were there. And we often think of urbanization as something that occurred closer to the turn of the 20th century, but actually rapid urbanization began in the antebellum decades. Now, both men and women embraced organized sports as participants and spectators, and they particularly embraced what would become our national pastime, baseball. So as we go down here, we see uh, from 1891, I believe, a prep school baseball team, a men's team. So we're in these decades uh, following the Civil War and baseball's growing in popularity, particularly among men in cities. Now, there were many voices of authority at this time who saw the social changes underway in the United States, industrialization, urbanization, immigration, they saw them as detrimental to masculinity, uh, particularly for middle-class and elite men. So the idea of manhood before all of these changes were underway, it was represented by a white man who owned land and served as the head of a nuclear family. Um, but that idea was really under threat by these trends. So sports were seen as this new arena in which um, a kind of idea or image of a really vigorous masculinity could be promoted, that sports were a realm where primal aggression could be released, but in a very regulated way that um, in no way interfered with civilized society. So at this time, sports are seen as an inherently male pursuit, but as Dr. Schultz put it so wonderfully in her book, quote, ambitious women have always dared to compete. So now I'm gonna leave the exhibit for a moment. I wanna show here, this is the 1876 Vassar College, um, one of their baseball teams, the Resolutes. So in the second half of the 19th century, women's colleges began to open and elite white families sent their daughters. These colleges readily um, adopted sports programs, seeing exercise as healthful for both the mind and the body. Vassar College, for example, um, so the team pictured here, they actually had a baseball team even a decade earlier in 1866. Students uh, at these colleges also joined in on archery, rowing, tennis, track, and eventually basketball. Now, while baseball is largely a male-dominated sport today, the first team at any level to actually be paid to play baseball was an all-female African-American team called the Philadelphia Dolly Bardens. Now this team played in long sleeved calico dresses, high button shoes and red jockey caps. The Dolly Vardens were played to pay, play baseball as early as 1867. And this is actually two years before the first men's team, which was the Cincinnati Red Stockings and they formed in 1869. So the Dolly Vardens were one of a number of teams in this period that um, they would go around, they would barnstorm and try to draw crowds by the novelty of, of kind of their act. And in this case, the novelty was the race and sex of their players. However, records um, unfortunately are thin because the press really didn't pay much attention to them. And frankly, much of the public disapproved of what they were doing. But the story is somewhat different for elite women who are playing at an amateur level, like the Vassar team here. So the NWHM has a wonderful article by Dr. Bonnie J. Morris that covers this history. It um, tells of how uh, the elite women's colleges and the country clubs that were associated with the, the grand wealth and, and leisure of the Gilded Age, this late 19th century period, it, they made certain sports acceptable uh, for aristocratic ladies, sports like tennis, croquet, archery, swimming. Of course, that last one had to take place at racially restricted lakes and beaches. 
Now, historians claim that these activities were more socially acceptable in part because of the elaborate and dignified outfits that the, the female athletes wore. Um, think white tennis skirts. These outfits inscribed the athletes with a feminine appearance. So these pursuits were understood to promote healthful beauty, but not competition or aggression or monetary compensation. So here I wanna get into some of the thought behind limiting women's participation in sports in the 19th century. So medical authorities dating back centuries understood all humans to possess a fixed amounts of energy. And further, they thought that women required all of that energy for the reproductive process. So it's one reason why women were discouraged from academics as well. The thought that intense study would deplete them of energy needed um, to sustain a pregnancy and endure childbirth. As Dr. Morris writes, quote, 19th century campaigns against higher education for women sounded very much like campaigns to prevent women from taking part in active sports. So this perhaps helps explain why women's colleges were a place where athletic activity did occur, as it was already a realm in which these uh, preva prevailing gender norms of the day were being tested. So amidst all these warnings about women's delicate natures, there were a wide array of exceptions when it suited the powers that be, or in other words, those you know, running the economy, running the government. At the time, women and children were working in unregulated, dangerous conditions in mills and factories. Um, men possessed the legal right to beat their wives and children. And you know, the, the countless violations that were inflicted upon enslaved women and free African-American women. And further, you know, the hard labor that rural homemakers um, undertook every day, it meant that many of these women were incredibly strong. Um, but since their tasks were coded as feminine and domestic, scrubbing floors, bringing laundry, lifting children, those efforts were not seen to hinder reproductive efforts in any way. And lastly, in another sign of, you know, to tell us how these ideas were culturally constructed, they gave way during extraordinary circumstances. Communities drawn women's strength during um, wartime when men were away, out on the frontier, you know, that gets into why suffrage for women expanded in the West before it did in the East. And actually, lastly, it shouldn't go without noting that all of this discourse assumes that reproduction was a woman's ultimate goal and highest purpose in life. So that's problematic in its own way. So now going back to the exhibit, sadly I have to skip over some. Um, here we have an early basketball game. So Smith College started a basketball team in 1891 only a few months after the game's invention. Uh, though the rules were adapted to prevent the young women's um, overexertion or too much you know, physical contact, dangerous um, activity, the students enthusiastically em embraced the game. Now the first intercollegiate women's basketball game, which is pictured here, was played in Berkeley between Cal and Stanford on April 4th, 1896. And uh, male spectators were banned. Um, and so I just, this, this image is so great, the drawing. Um, I just wanna draw attention to the bloomers that they're all wearing. Um, so public attitudes toward collegiate women's sports at this time were conflicted. Some elements of popular culture embraced these new confident athletic women. They were seen as in line with the new woman of the period, a, a modern independent, often suffragist, um, always white woman. Um, but you know, many were still disturbed by the sight of women sweating, running, competing. So here I want to draw us to um, some early basketball. This is from 1904, as you can see. And what we have going on here is six on six girls basketball. Um, now this was played essentially like two three on three games um, at either end of the court. Uh, each team had you know, three players on either end. They could not pass center court line. They had to stay on their sides. Um, no, you could not dribble more than twice. And um, a referee was required to inbound the ball after every basket. 
Um, so this version of basketball uh, would actually continue to be played in some states, most commonly Iowa, as, as late as the early 1990s. Um, so I'm gonna, okay, I'll, I'll, I can let it go. Um, I just wanna suggest, uh, you know, after maybe you look at this to then pull up some highlights of what some NCAA women's basketball teams are doing these days. It's quite the contrast. Um, okay, and one quick fun fact, um, I'm gonna go back to the exhibit here, is that in 1908, the Amateur Athletic Union declared that it would never um, permit girls to play basketball games in public places. Now, I really enjoyed learning this because, um, you know, they had determined the game was too rough, but today, any youth athlete who's looking to play in college or um, in professional basketball, male or female, is pretty much guaranteed to pursue playing on an AAU team. Um, it's a big part of youth basketball uh, for all young female players now. So women and girls continued to pursue sports in the early decades of the 20th century. They started making headway in the Olympic events that they were allowed to participate in. Um, which was this ever-changing patchwork of events. And you can learn more about that if you look at our Women in the Olympics resources, um, or even go and watch the walkthrough I did of that material a few weeks ago, which is online now. So attitudes towards socially elite women in sports shifted again around the 1920s and 1930s. While men were encouraged to pursue athletic competition as a training ground for business success, women were discouraged and even blocked from competition uh, for fear that it would make them less feminine. Let me scroll down here a bit. Okay, so here we have Helen Wills Moody. Um, and so I wanna talk about a few impressive female athletes from this period. Now, Helen Wills Moody, seen here, won eight Wimbledon singles championship titles between 1927 and 1938. And actually between 1926 and 1932, she did not lose even one set in singles tennis. So she achieved national acclaim, but you know, many um, in, in the sports media and fans were put off by her, her serious and intense on-court behavior. They criticized her as merciless toward her opponents and nicknamed her Little Miss Poker Face. Um, so eventually she retired um, as a respected but not beloved athlete. And another big name from the period, uh, Mildred Didrikson Zaharias. There's so much to say about Didrikson. So in 1930, the Dallas-based um, Employers Casualty Company hired a star high school athlete, Mildred Didrikson, nicknamed Babe after Babe Ruth. Um, she's also a great baseball player. Um, they hired her as a clerical worker, but her real role with the insurance company was as a forward on the company's basketball team. Uh, and she eventually led that team to a national championship. She then won two gold medals in the Olympics at the, 1930, at the 1932 Olympics in track, um, and then switched to golf where she also dominated as a major star. Um, so I have to skip down a bit, but here we have um, a picture of uh, Babe Didrikson. So now Didrikson was criticized for appearing too masculine, and this criticism was not uncommon. In addition to the medical rationales that were given um, to prevent women from participating in sports, there was also an aesthetic one that was very common. It said that only unattractive women excelled at sports, or alternatively, that excelling at sports made women unattractive. And also many you know, spectators wrote off the site of women competing as a quote, unsightly spectacle. So Didrikson, she changed her appearance to mollify critics wearing more feminine clothing and focusing more on golf as seen here, which was seen as a more appropriately feminine sport and less on track and field. In 1938, she married a male professional wrestler, George Zaharias that it was actually a woman, fellow golfer, Betty Dodds, with whom she was known to have her most intimate relationship late at the end of her life in the 40s and 50s. Um, so she has since been reclaimed as a queer icon. Now, in addition to basketball, track and field and golf, 
Didrikson also excelled, as I said, at baseball, at tennis, at swimming, numerous other sports. It's really hard to overstate how dominant she was. Um, I'll just simply note that the Associated Press named her the single greatest female athlete of the first half of the 20th century. Okay, I wanna scroll up here to this great headstand image. Um, so now we're approaching the mid 20th century and many girls were still admonished to avoid unladylike competitive and contact sports. Instead, they were directed toward healthful exercise activities like calisthenics. Um, so physical educators at the time wanted to encourage exercise for girls and women more than competition. So that's what we see pictured here. Now, working class women and women of color were not held to the same social standard as elite white women. Business and factories formed employee club teams to play in highly competitive amateur leagues, which included both men's and women's teams and teams wore their sponsor's name on their uniform for advertising. And that's what we see pictured here. Um, so while the teams existed to market company products and brands, they still offered um, many working class women unprecedented access to sports participation. I think the most well-known example of this comes from the film, A League of Their Own. Um, at the beginning of the film, the Henson sisters play for a team sponsored by their local dairy. And so that brings us to the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Um, that's the league, of course, featured in A League of Their Own. It was conceived by Chicago Cubs owner Philip K. Wrigley to make money while men's baseball was um, suspended during World War II. He insisted that his girls would play like men but look like ladies. So the players, all white women, had to adhere to strict standards of femininity, um, in their dress code, in their hairstyles, they had to follow curfews. Um, these female players were presented as an emergency wartime resource, similar to the women serving in the military at this time, or those working in um, factories to, you know, supply, um, you know, airplanes for the war effort, that sort of thing. Um, and the league was profitable. Now, it did close after 11 years in 1954, um, and this is several years after men returned from World War II, but it was still the victim of the gender norms that underwent this retrenchment, this kind of um, constricting after having been expanded during the exigencies of World War II. So now I wanna bring in some materials from the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Um, so the AAGPBL was segregated, but some Latina women who were able to pass for white did join. Um, here we see Marge Villa. Um, this is her team from uh, East Los Angeles, the Garvey Stars. Villa is front and center. Um, and here we see her jersey um, from the team. And uh, she went on to sign in the AAGPBL in 1946. She played for five years for the Kenosha Comets. Um, so this is a great site. You can see the back of her jersey here and her baseball card, of course, issued decades later in 1995 after the film A League of Their Own. And so I wanted to bring up women's patio teams. Um, Mexican-American women's teams gained popularity during the 1930s when Latinas, um, you know, in this period, they were segregated and where they lived, where they worked, where they went to school um, and recreation as well. And, but because of this, they carved out their own, um, you know, their own spaces to play baseball and softball. And these vadio teams flourished um, on makeshift community diamonds. Uh, local churches and small businesses would sponsor the teams. And, um, and yeah, and the sport was very popular and women could participate. So these teams provided a socially acceptable venue for young Mexican-American women to assert their autonomy and athleticism and cultural and ethnic pride while also um, challenging the socially constructed uh, notions of gender and femininity of the period. Now for um, African-American women, the case is slightly different. Um, they uh, at times played in the Negro Leagues. Now, Tony Stone pictured here, uh, for example, she played on various Negro League teams in the 1940s and 1950s. 
When she joined the Indianapolis Clowns in 1953, she's pictured here in the Clowns uniform. She replaced the second baseman who had left uh, the Clowns to go onto the major leagues. And that was a player by the name of Henry Aaron. So you might've heard of him. Um, so African-American communities were more supportive of black women in competitive sports. Many black colleges and universities encouraged athletics as a pathway to improve community health and promote leadership. In 1939, a survey noted that um, while 83% of predominantly white colleges uh, disapproved of women's intercollegiate athletics, for black colleges, that number was only 25%. So still sizable, but much less. And this really reflected social realities in that physical strength was a necessary part of life for many black women who had to do hard work to support their families. Daintiness was not an accessible virtue for them the way it was for moneyed white women. But going back to the exhibit, here we have Wilma Rudolph, track star. Um, so Wilma Rudolph won a bronze medal at the 1956 Olympic games but it was in 1960, uh, the games were in Rome where she kind of became an international superstar. Her, she had a very inspiring story. She overcame polio as a little girl. And in 1960, won three gold medals at the Olympics. And these Olympics were the first to be broadcast on television. And so she really helped to shift public perceptions of what women could accomplish in sports. And now while on the subject of running, I have to mention Catherine Switzer. So in 1967, Catherine Switzer was the first woman to run the Boston Marathon as a registered entrant. Um, she, at the time, she was a 19-year-old university student at um, Syracuse University, and she would unofficially train with the men's cross-country team there. So the team also had a, a kind of volunteer coach. He was a veteran of 15 Boston Marathons himself. His name was Arnie Briggs. He's 50 years old. And he took Switzer under his wing, but nevertheless, he insisted that no woman could run the race, that it was too difficult. Switzer, indignant at this, pointed out that in fact, a woman had already run the race. Um, she was referring to the previous year in 1966, when a woman named Roberta Gibb had actually hidden in bushes on the side and jumped into the race right after it started and ran the entire thing. But of course, that was unofficial. Still sure of himself, her trainer Briggs said that if Switzer could run the distance in practice, he would take her to Boston himself. So a few weeks before the marathon, they set out to run 26 miles and they complete it. Um, and at the end, Switzer, you know, proud, wanting to put on insurance for the actual Boston marathon said, let's run five extra miles. And Briggs agrees, and so they set out. And so after 31 miles, they are um, they stop, and Switzer is very excited at her accomplishment. Goes to hug Briggs. Unfortunately, it was Briggs who passed out from the exertion. But true to his word, he took her to the Boston Marathon. Um, so at the time, it was actually not officially in the rule book that women couldn't run. It was it was very much an unofficial um, ruling. And so Switzer registered under her initials, KB Switzer. And at the time, um, qualifying times were not required either to run in the race. So Switzer, Briggs, Switzer's boyfriend and another runner ran the race together. Now Switzer went unnoticed by officials until mile four when the press truck caught sight of her. Um, yes, here we go. Uh, and so here what we see is um, obviously Catherine Switzer right here, 261. Behind her is Jock Semple. He was the race manager and he was incensed that a woman was running his race, ran up behind her and tried to tear the numbers off of her shirt and yelled at her to get out of his race. Um, what we see here is Arnie Briggs, her trainer, who actually knows Semple and is trying to protect Switzer and say, no, she's with me, she can do it. Um, and over here in the corner is Switzer's boyfriend who was actually a football player. And he also sets out to defend her and actually lowers his shoulder and tackles Semple to the ground. Um, Switzer went on to finish the race in four hours and 20 minutes and made headlines in the process. So 
five years later in 1972, women were officially allowed to compete in the Boston Marathon. Um, Semple still didn't make it easy for them. Uh, female runners had to meet the same qualifying time as the male runners. So that year, only eight women qualified, one of whom was Switzer. And here we see them actually in 1973, so the next year. Um, Semple never officially apologized, but they did become friends later on. And to give you an idea of how things have changed, at least in marathon running, um, looking back to 2019, in that year um, of all the runners in the Boston Marathon, 45% of them were women. Okay, so back to the exhibit and Title IX. Sorry, I guess skipped ahead. Here we go. So on June 23rd, 1972, Congress enacted Title IX of the Education Amendments. This statute prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program or activity receiving any type of federal financial aid. So before Title IX, um, some example conditions of girls and women's sports. Uh, the public school system in Waco, Texas had uh, $1 million athletic facilities, but girls at the time only had use of the tennis balls. At the University of Kansas, female athletes um, on the track team drove overnight to get to their meets. And when they arrived, they slept on wrestling mats on the floor of the gym. While the male athletes were transported at the university's expense and put up at hotels. And at the time, the average Big Ten University spent 1,300 times as much money on the average male athlete than on the average female athlete. So Title IX was thought of as a law to open up universities to, to female um, students, particularly like law students and medical students. And, and it was that. Um, it's important to note that you know, Title IX came about because of, uh, largely because of newly elected women in Congress, such as Patsy Mink, the main sponsor. But in 1974, the federal agency tasked with um, like overseeing and implementing Title IX established that it also pertained to comparable athletic opportunities. Now, we have to note that the, the government didn't require exactly equal spending on men and women's athletics, um, but equal opportunities. And so that includes essentially equal access to athletic uh, facilities, um, equal funding for scholarships, that sort of thing. Um, and here in the exhibit, you'll see we have some great uh, clips and videos of this discussion with Do Dr. Bonnie Morris um, about Title IX. So I encourage you to, to check those out. Um, but I'm gonna skip down to talk about Billie Jean King briefly. Um, you know, the tennis champion, there's so much to say about her. She lobbied for equal prize money, helped to start the women's tennis tour, and famously defeated former male champion Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sexes in 1973. She inspired many women, you know, in tennis and on all sports. And she's also a lesbian icon. She was actually publicly outed in 1981. Um, and her reps at the time encouraged her to deny the accusation um, but she refused, and she did indeed lose all her endorsement deals at the time. But as you probably know, her career recovered. Um, if you watched the Super Bowl last week, uh, you would have seen that she did the coin flip at the beginning, um, and that was actually in honor of the 50th anniversary of Title IX. So going back to um, Title IX, I want to scroll down to this great chart we have. So Title IX, you know, it was a watershed moment in American history that opened the doors to women's participation in school-sponsored competitive sports. Um, since then, high school girls' participation in organized sports has increased tenfold, as you can see it, across this chart. Um, and in, in collegiate sports, it has increased sixfold. But girls still face challenges. Um, over the year, the law has been inconsistently enforced and schools have often been out of compliance with it, which means that many girls have had to fight to ensure the implementation of the law. Now, Title IX increase and, and increased girls' athletic participation um, led to uh, big strides such as 20% uh, of um, in the rise of female educational attainment for the generation that came of age after the law. 
a 10% increase in the number of women working full time, 12% spike in a women's participation in previously male dominated um, occupations, particularly highly skilled professions. Um, and here I just briefly want to note, uh, as since the Olympics just ended, to give you an idea of, of some parity of where we are now. Um, and also I have to note the Paralympics start in about two weeks, so keep an eye out for that. Um, that in 2018, Team USA sent its highest number ever of female athletes to the Winter Games, 131 women. And this year on the um, Team USA roster for the Winter Olympics, there were 107 women to 115 men. So not totally equal, but very close. And last summer at the um, Summer Olympics in Tokyo, that US Team USA roster marked the third straight Summer Olympics in which um, more women than men were on the Team USA roster. Now, of course, there are still problems. Um, although women and girls have made enormous achievements in breaking down all the different barriers, social, political, cultural, that have hindered equality and full participation in sports, um, work still remains. According to the National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education, in addition to having fewer participation opportunities, girls often endure um, inferior treatment in areas such as equipment, facilities, coaching, scheduling, and publicity. Um, and you can see you know, how the participation still lags behind that of boys in this chart. So American society continues to struggle with what it means to be an athlete and how to apply that definition to women and girls. So now I wanna speak uh, briefly about some of the battles that are still being waged today. Uh, so you might know of uh, the lawsuit of the US Women's National Soccer Team. They sued uh, the US Soccer Federation alleging unequal pay compared to the men's national team. Now that lawsuit is pending appeal right now. Um, and the equal pay calculations are actually complicated because um, the women's team has one more victories than the men's team. And so they've earned more in prize money but the issue is that their base pay is still lower. Um, and so that's the, the basis of the suit. Um, so equal pay, you know, equal pay for women, it's an issue in ordinary workplaces. It's an issue in you know, the top level of sports as well. Looking over to gymnastics um, and the sexual abuse scandal there, uh, USA Gymnastics and the US Olympic Commun Committee uh, recently agreed to pay gymnasts who were sexually abused by Larry Nasser, the former doctor for the national team, $380 million. Now in 2018, over 100 gymnasts made headlines when they stood in front of Nasser in court and gave witness statements describing his abuse and its consequences, as well as how they persevered. And this story reflects the wider reckoning with sexual and gender-based violence that's occurring in our culture right now. Next, I wanna to go to this picture. Some of you might remember it from last year's NCAA basketball tournament. Um, so the University of Oregon women's basketball players had some tweets that went viral in March of 2021. They showed the disparities between the weight room facilities at the men's tournament and the women's tournament. So above you see the vast array of equipment provided for the men and below you see the entirety of the equipment that was provided for the women. Now, the um, you know, outrage that came after um, this was highlighted, it led to formal investigations of the NCAA treatment of men's and women's sports. And so one thing that came out of those investigations is merely rhetorical, but I think still important. And that is the NCAA basketball coming up um, very shortly. This will be the first time that the term March Madness is used in reference to the women's tournament. Until now, it's only been used in conjunction with the men's tournament. Um, so it's nice to get that term <laughs> equally applied. Um, it was also found that the NCAA spends more on male athletes than female athletes in championship tournaments, that it only considers the men's sports to be revenue producing, even though the um, individuals doing the investigation couldn't pin down a clear definition of what that meant to the NCAA. And most importantly, that the NCAA wasn't funding promotion for the two groups equally, 
So really the women's tournaments weren't even being given the chance to generate the same kind of revenue. And then there's also another area that we have to look at besides simply that of the players, um, really two areas, journalism and coaching. Um, so I wanted to draw attention to a milestone uh, from a few weeks ago. Back on February 9th, um, there was an NBA game broadcast on ESPN. It was between the, the Warriors and the Jazz. And for the first time ever, the broadcast was led by a women-only team. So that's both the on-air team doing the play-by-play -play and color commentary and the folks back um, behind the scenes. So both in Salt Lake City and back at ESPN headquarters in Connecticut, first time it was 33 women who ran the broadcast. Um, and so I just think that's pretty cool. Um, and there's also women making great strides in professional coaching. Uh, I think the, the biggest um, example would be Kim Eng. Um, back in November, 2020, Kim Eng was named the general manager of the Miami Marlins. She was the, the first female GM in the history of a major North American men's professional sport. Also the first East Asian American to lead a major league baseball team. And she'd worked in baseball for decades and had interviewed for GM positions at least 10 times beforehand only to be passed over every time. There were a number of other milestones in 2020. Um, there was an NFL game, which was the first to feature female coaches on both sidelines, um, as well as a female referee, a woman named Sarah Thomas, who went on to become the first female uh, referee of a Super Bowl game. In basketball, um, San Antonio Spurs assistant coach, Becky Hammond became the first woman to serve as the head coach in an NBA game when she took over for her boss, uh, Greg Popovich, who had been ejected from the game. Um, in baseball, there's also been um, coaching advancements in addition to Aang as GM. Um, Alyssa Nakin of the Giants was the first woman to serve as an on-field coach in an MLB game. And in January, 2021, the Boston Red Sox hired Bianca Smith as a minor league coach, making her the first black woman to coach in pro baseball history. Um, so the fight for equal access and respect in sports continues for women, but we've made enormous strides as players, coaches, and journalists in nearly every sport. So the battle reflects the broader issues of gender justice in our society, problems of sexual violence, homophobia, access to education, opportunities in the economy, economy military, and politics, the list goes on. But in the meantime, as Dr. Schultz would say, ambitious women will always dare to compete. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mari. That was a great presentation. I, I really love this topic and I, I love that we were able to explore it throughout the, the month of, of February. And you too have mentioned that this is um, an area of great interest for you. And it certainly deviates away from um, your dissertation topic and, and some of the things you're really focusing on right now uh, for the audience. Mari is like headstrong on her way to graduating this summer and we're so proud. Um, tell us a little bit about your interest. How did you come to uh, in, enjoy this topic. Um, were you? Are you an athlete yourself? Just for curiosity's sake, really. Yes. <laughs> uh, Lorian, I'll have to say, just you're gonna have to stop me at some point talking about this. So, uh, athlete from uh, I think the time my dad put a ball in my hands around age two. Uh, yeah, played every sport: softball, basketball, field hockey, a little bit of soccer, everything. Um, and when you combine that with uh, my interest in history from a young age, it meant that I also was reading mostly every baseball history book I could get my hands on in elementary school. Um, so sports history is really one of the things that most got me into history in the beginning. Um, I think I had mentioned this to Lorianne that I have good friends who still insist, even though I tell them I'm writing a dissertation about comedy, they're like, no, you, you study women in sports. That's what you do. Um, and gosh, a whole lot of other reasons. So it's my love of history. It's my love of sports. I think I was, I was also, um, I like to bring up, I was 10 years old when the WNBA started. And at the time I was very confused as to why women would not just play in the NBA with men. And so that it just, 
<laughs> I find it kind of amusing that it boggled my mind. Um, but it, it got me interested in like, okay, what is the story? Why did we not already have our own lake? Um, and so I had to uh, read everything I could find about that. You provided a, a resource um, about the history of the WNBA that I shared with the audience in the chat. In fact, I shared quite a few um, resources uh, as did other participants. So I, I hope you take note of those. And if you heard something, saw something uh, that looked interesting to you, you'll um, explore further. Um, one of the questions, I, I personally, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A right now. So you, you must've done a very thorough presentation. <laughs> Um, but I had a question when you were talking uh, about the, the uh, women's basketball teams back in the, the early uh, 20th century when they played three on three games. And you said this kind of went on, uh, particularly in Iowa until the, the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. What was the reason for that, that it, it did it just become sort of a, its own fun game or, or what was the reasoning there? Yes, um, so I have done a little bit of research uh, on this, it's been a while. I wrote a term paper all the way back in high school on the history of women's basketball. And what I what I know generally, and so I, I can't speak to the specifics on this because it's been too long, but the, the um, kind of six on six, you can't move half court. Those rules stayed as largely the, the main rules under which girls played basketball um, past the middle of the 20th century. It, it was, it was, um, it, it varied place to place where the rules changed. I, I think it was common between even the 60s and the 60s and 70s in a lot of places. Um, I can tell you, I briefly played in a pickup league with women who I was in my 20s, they were in their 50s and 60s, and sometimes they um, had trouble remembering the new rules because they had learned the old way. And, um, and so just you know, that was a little disconnect for them. Now, particularly in Iowa, from my reading, it became a very much a um, like local niche kind of fun tradition. I, I might liken it to sort of like candle pin bowling in, in the Northeast, something like that. It was, it was like their tradition and it would draw big crowds. So I think it's kind of like any sport where um, when you take away that stigma of, oh, you know, the girls can't handle the other way to play basketball, it's simply different rules, a different challenge. Like it could still, you know, absolutely be fun to play. Um, I think it's really about having the choice of which version you play. Uh, and yeah, and so what I read was Iowa, um, the high school system stopped officially playing it in 93, that it left Oklahoma still had a little bit of it. Um, so I think just local flavor, but as um, especially colleges, as college scholarships kind of became an issue, more and more high schools then switch to the way colleges were doing it. So that's where you got the transition. The great explanation, thank you for that. And um, I'm not seeing any other questions, last chance. Go ahead and drop those in the Q&A feature if you like, otherwise I'm going to ask one more question of you, Mari, and that is particularly with the um, sort of the ethical issues that have been uh, kind of plaguing women's sports in, in recent years. Yes, there have been successes where women are, are, are becoming more recognized for, the, for their expertise and professionalism in pro sports in particular, but, the, but these scandals that still come up. What is the biggest takeaway? What would you have us learn from both sides of that coin that you, you shared with us right there at the end of your presentation? What would you, uh, Again, what was the, the lesson learned there? Um, what, what would you like to, how would, bleh, where would you like to see women's sports moving in the future? Again, um, it's a personal question. Yeah, I maybe a couple answers to this. The, the biggest thing that comes to mind is simply needing more women in the room in every environment. So thinking um, how some of these scandals might be different if there were simply more women in the front office and on the coaching staff running the Olympic committee, um, that is not a, a gender equal organization. Um, in all the situations, it's not to say that, oh, put women in charge and there will never be a problem again. It's simply that getting more perspectives in there, um, just, just 
yeah, it, it needs to be people who understand um, a little bit more where the athletes are coming from. And um, so, so getting, yeah, more women in the room. I had one other, um, oh, I'm blanking on it, that, uh, yeah. And then I, I, okay, so then the other thing I really want is um, when you're studying the history, it's kind of really cool to read about, you know, Jackie Mitchell, who's in one of these articles who in 1931 struck out Babe Ruth and, and Lou Gehrig. Um, that's great, but to make it less of an exceptionalism story and more about what groups of women are doing, um, what they're doing on their own, not putting it side by side with what the men are doing. Um, and so I think going forward, as much as we can, can do that, that it's, um, that the contributions of women are, are valued on their own and that it's, we see the value in, in kind of the whole story and not just the one cool sports thing somebody did, particularly if she beat a man um, that one time, like, let's, let's leave that aside and they're impressive on their own. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. that that's a, a great takeaway. And I, I'm going to leave it there. And, um, just say my final thank yous and farewells here. Um, thank you for to all our participants who joined us here today. Uh, just a reminder that the program today was recorded and will be available on our website. It'll be later this week uh, when that becomes available on um, you can link to it from our website. It'll take you out to the museum's YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on Thursday, February 24th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time for NWHM Presents. Um, the celebration of the Maya Angelou coin and the American Women Quarters program with the U.S. Mint. The NWHM will be in conversation about the American Women Quarters program with members of the team that helped bring this coin program to life. Representatives from the U, excuse me, United States Mint, the National Women's History Museum, and the Smithsonian Institution will discuss the new Maya Angelou quarter, the first coin released in this historic coin program, and the American Women's Quarters program. Attendees will get a behind the scenes look at various aspects of the program from the honorary selection process, which you helped with, to the development and selection of each coin design. Don't miss this inspiring event. I think you'll find it vastly interesting. For a full list of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the public programs tab on www.womenshistory.org. All events are free, but advanced registration is required. Thank you again, Mariana. Thank you again to our participants. And until next time we meet, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.